It was a love that time forgot, a love engraved in stone, a love for the ages. A love that set a young scientist named Niles Eldridge free and on the path to fame. A love for arthropods. But more than love, there was the science. Major museums frequently update their exhibits to keep up with changing views. But where do these new ideas in science come from? Sometimes they're the result of fresh discoveries, but often they come from scientists who take a new look at old information. Niles Eldridge is one such scientist. His work has led to major changes in the way most researchers think about evolution. It's often difficult to piece these jigsaw puzzles together properly. Eldridge decided to work with extinct relatives of crabs and shrimp called trilobites. They lived in the ancient seas that once covered most of the central and southern United States. By comparing a great many fossils in this way, Eldridge hoped to uncover evidence of gradual evolutionary change over time. So I set out. I went out with my brother. I went out with my wife at various times and drove all over the Midwest. It was an education unto itself and uh, collected fossils wherever we could, using guidebooks and so forth, finding our own places. And uh, I started to realize that all the fossils I was collecting, whether it was in New York or in Iowa or wherever, uh, and whatever part of time I was, in the lowest, uh, earliest parts of time, or six million years later, up near the end of the history of the species, they all look the same to me. And at first I put that down to inexperience. I thought, well, I'm not working actually under a, a, a trilobite expert. Uh, maybe I just uh, am not good enough to see the obvious changes uh, that are here. And I remember one day it was particularly horrible because I was back at the museum and I saw some specimens from Germany. Uh, and I couldn't tell them apart from, from my specimens from the American Midwest. So I said, oh, this is awful. And maybe if I can uh, me make lots of measurements and use the computer, we uh, did a lot of mathematical treatment of these things, uh, I'll, I'll find out some, some results. I'll get some positive results. I was desperate to get positive results because I was doing a PhD thesis. Uh, the uh, whole object of a PhD thesis is to demonstrate that you know how to frame a scientific study and to carry it out successfully. And here I was a failure because uh, after collecting for one summer, coming back and looking at the fossils for a whole year and then going out in the summer again and finding no evidence of change whatsoever, I, I could only see that as a failure. I got a pattern of change and a pattern of distribution. I could see that they were acting as though they were different species, closely related species, but they were different and that there had been some change, finally, you know, in, the, in this eight million year period of time. Finally, there was something to talk about. And I realized, though, that the pattern did not conform to what I was initially looking for, which was what Darwin told us we ought to find, which was that as you go through time, you're going to get this progressive change very slowly accumulating through time. The big signal here is that once a species appears, it tends to persist for millions of years without showing much change. Or maybe a little variation here and there, but not a great deal of change. It's a tremendous amount of stability. So I had grown up thinking that evolution, given eight million years and a complex anatomy, it'd be inevitable that you'd find change. And what I was finding out was there was almost no change at all. And what such change that there was was fairly trivial. Um, so that's tremendous stability. That was interesting. Not predicted either by Darwin, although he knew about the phenomenon, but he sort of brushed it aside. Uh, but certainly not uh, predicted by modern genetics, which is the core of, of modern uh, evolutionary theory. Working together, Eldridge and Gould called their new pattern punctuated equilibria. 
punctuated equilibria refers to this pattern that we have uh, of tremendous stability, of non-change of species once they first appear. They tend to go on with these invertebrates for 5 or 10, even 15 million years without showing much evolutionary change. That's the equilibrium part of it. And when you do get evolutionary change, it tends to be concentrated in these splitting events when one species will, will diverge off from another. And that will happen perhaps in five or 50,000 or even 100,000 years of time. It doesn't take a great deal of time for that divergence to happen. Uh, we, we have learned more things, and we have changed our perspective. We see that Darwin wasn't entirely right about everything, but that would be terrible because <laughs> that we would have nothing to do. See, this is, this is my other hat. I've spent most of my life arguing with Darwin. Nothing in punctuated equilibria has anything to do it's to say that, that, that natural selection isn't right or, 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 or any of these other microevolutionary processes that are so ably documented and have been all along are, are somehow irrelevant or not right. They are all right, and it all has to fit together. But some of these larger scale patterns, and I have to say from the fossil record, Darwin knew about that, but he swept it under the rug. So. Well, all we were trying to do, so we, we seem to be anti-Darwinian, and we maybe were a little bit uh, argumentative ourselves in our, in our way we approach uh, the world, but uh, and, and, uh, sort of in your face a little bit. But it was a climate that, that we were in that basically didn't recognize any of those patterns. Darwin himself stopped looking at the patterns. The thing that gets me about Darwin is that it was fossils that took him to the idea in the first place. You know, and then he just ran out from it. So, uh, er, anyway. <laughs> so, the <laughs> punctuated equilibria is an attempt to basically, I think, sort of set, sort of get some of these empirical things back into the mix. But arguing with Darwin has its personal price. Charted over time, we see this disturbing punctuated trend. Punctuated equilibrium can affect even logic centers. I have a question about earlier in your lecture, you had said that science can never show any absolute truth. Aren't you claiming then that you have absolute truth in saying that? No, I'm just saying it's the rules of the game. It's just the rules of the, it's just a logical necessity of the rules of the game. I mean, I didn't say there was no such thing as absolute truth. I'm saying that the conclusions of science can never be po posited as being absolutely true. And if that's an absolute truth that I've just given you, that has nothing to do with the veracity of what I said about science. I'm Eugenie Scott. I'm the executive director of the National Center for Science Education. The Friend of Darwin Award began many years ago in the beginning of NCSE back in the late 80s and early 90s as a way for us to thank the volunteers that we had back in those early days who helped us so much. Uh, one early recipient, for example, was a um, computer consultant who uh, kept our machines going and built our first network and our first uh, uh, baby website and things like that. As NCSE grew and became better known nationally as the go-to place for the creationism and evolution controversy, we began using the Friend of Darwin Awards as a thank you for the people we worked with, the scientists and teachers and other citizens around the country who really stood up for science education and stood up for evolution education. Our 2011 Friend of Darwin recipient, Niles Eldridge, fits both categories. Niles was there in 1980, in the very beginning of the Committees of Correspondence, the, the ancestral group to the National Center for Science Education. He was there with Stan Weinberg and Jack Friedman and the others to help form an organization of teachers and scientists that would combat equal time for creation science laws. He has never flagged in his dedication to NCSC, in his help for us, he has always been very responsive whenever we've asked him for advice or for assistance of any kind. We truly are grateful to him for all the support he has given to NCSC. At the same time, he has also been a large supporter of evolution education and of keeping the creationists out of science class in many ways, through his writings, through his work at the American Museum of Natural History, through his uh, support of the uh, New York Committee for Science Education. 
We owe Niles Eldridge a great deal of thanks at NCSC. We are very grateful to Niles Eldridge for his decades of support of NCSC and for evolution education. We're very pleased to award him the 2011 Friend of Darwin Award. Congratulations.